Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I, I think we should be kind of excited on a Sunday morning. We, we all have a different personality, and some of us are quieter than others, but it's an exciting thing to be in God's house, worshiping our risen Savior together with the people of God. It's an exciting thing, and we should practice because this is eternity for us. Turn, if you would, to the book of Zechariah. I'm going to be reading from chapter 8. Zechariah 8, starting with verse 1. And the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion, will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you who in those days, in these days, have been hearing these words from the mouth of the prophets, who were present on the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For behold, for before those days, there was no wage for man or any wage for beast, Neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or came in, for I said every man against his neighbor. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord of hosts. For there shall be a sowing of peace. The vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its produce, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And as you have been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus says the Lord of hosts, as I purpose to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts, so again I have purposed in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear not. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one. of the tent shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love truth and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. It's good to know that our Lord reigns from generation to generation. His kingdom will have no end. Um, what a blessing it is to be on the right team, so to speak. Let's go to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 proves that God's plans can't be thwarted. You know we've been speaking about Israel and the Jewish nation. And we know that God is sovereign in his dealings with that nation. Romans 11. And believe it or not, I'm going to read through it. But the message is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to give a big preliminary to Romans 11. But let's read, let me read some of it. 
Romans chapter 11. The Apostle Paul says, I say then, has God rejected his people? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a seed of Abraham, and of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life. By the way, I stopped there for a second. A lot of times in, in depression, whether we have it or someone else, you're believing things that are not true. And so that wasn't true there, was it, right? He wasn't the only one left. Look at the next verse, verse 4. But what does the divine response say to him? I have left for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In this way, then, at the present time, a remnant, according to God's grace's choice, has also come to be. But if it is by grace, it's no longer by works, otherwise grace is no longer grace, what then? Israel is seeking, uh, what Israel is seeking it has not obtained, but the chosen obtained it and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Verse 11 of Romans 11. I say then, did they stumble so as to fall? And there's that may it never be again. May it never be. By their transgression, and I, I want to say something that I, I'm going to introduce my message with um, a, a polemic against anti-Semitism. And these verses again are amazing. Just these kinds of verses should lead believers in Christ to know that we have an indebtedness to the Jewish people. Because if you think about it, God chose to have everything come through them. The Bible, the prophets, the apostles, Old Testament, New Testament, for the most part, Messiah himself from the Jews. But watch. And even their stumbling brought blessing to us. Look at verse 11. I said, did they, did they stumble so as to fall? May it never be. By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, watch this, how much more will their fullness be? If God restores the nation in a special way and saves a, a, a large portion of the nation, we would rejoice, right? How much more will their fullness be if their transgression brought Salvation to us, how much of, if they come to know the Lord on large scale. Verse 13, but I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch as I'm an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move my fellow countrymen and to, uh, to jealousy, my fellow countrymen, and save some of them. If their rejection, here it is again, similar thought. If their rejection of the world, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, I'm sorry. If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. Well, let's pray. Lord, as we come before you now, we know that you are more than able to save, to sanctify, to guide, to shepherd your people. And so, Lord, we thank you that you've done that in our lives. Thank you that you've done that for brothers and sisters in Christ that we've known. We thank you, Lord, that having been forgiven of our sins, there was a joy, and there still is a joy, that your son has paid the full price for the sins that we've committed. And we thank you that we're your children. And we thank you that you draw us to your word day by day. You draw us to the fellowship. And these are all signs that we know you. And Lord, on a daily basis, you encourage us with your word. And then even as we meet together, we're able to encourage one another. Lord, I thank you for the fellowship of God's people here. And I thank you that time and time again, whether myself or others, 
have found strength and consolation and encouragement in being together with God's people. And I pray, Lord, that would continue until your son comes. And Lord, we think of loved ones represented by all of us here. Lord, whether it's our brothers, our sisters, our children, our uh, aunts, uncles, grandparents, parents, we're praying that we would live in such a way that we would manifest the fruit of the Spirit to them and that would make the gospel attractive that they might, Lord, hear from us that the Savior has come and made atonement for sin and risen victoriously from the dead. So, Lord, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this time that we're having together. And I pray that everyone who's come would be enriched, Lord, by the praises, by your word. Um, Lord, by the testimony that we will hear. And by the fellowship after the service as well. Strengthen us to be your people and even your evangelists at this time. Lord, help us today as we get into your word this morning, and I pray that you might embolden us and encourage us to have the right view of Jew and Gentile alike. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, anti-Semitism seems to be in style. It's in vogue. Did you realize that recently I saw in Channel 12 News and in Newsday that there's hate graffiti that has now been found in the high schools and middle schools, right? That includes Comac, Smithtown, Syosset. I'll read uh, from one article I read here. Anti-black, I don't know how that, that got thrown in there. Anti-black and anti-Jewish graffiti was reported in several Long Island schools this week. The latest in what educators have called an alarming spate, spate of hate incidents that reflect a national trend. So it's not just in our area, but it's pretty widespread. Um, in a Jerusalem Post, it said that there were SWAT stickers that were also found in Port Jefferson Village schools. As you know as well, there are many pro-Palestinian and sometimes going as far as being pro-Hamas protests. The pro-Palestinian ones were outside the uh, Democratic National Headquarters. Uh, in London, there were similar protests where 128 people were arrested. Uh, this, is really, this is really an important issue, how Christians should view, how we believers should view Jewish people in light of all that's going on. I mentioned to you that Part of my second little job is on some Saturdays going to um, a Jewish community center. Um, and when I went to it this time, this Saturday, we were helping autistic kids exercise. And it's uh, Jewish owned and run, uh, but you know all kinds of other people are in there. And uh, certainly the young people that come who have autism are from all different backgrounds. But as I was uh, walking out, I didn't even notice it as I was walking in for some reason, there were 140 chairs representing what you think? The hostages. And they had the names. So there were these plastic chairs and, and the names of every single one of the hostages on there. Um, do you realize that these, these hostages too, their names are being put on posters and they're being put up in various places, whether college campuses or in the city, and what are people doing? They're tearing them down. Tearing them down, not even acknowledging that hostages should be recognized and perhaps prayed for, tearing those posters down. Um, I have seen um, videos of individual Jewish students being harassed as they're walking on campus, just for being Jewish. And a friend of mine, who's, uh, he has a Jewish last name, he's told me that somebody has told his kids to be careful because they have a, a last name that's, that, that has a Jewish sound to it. Um, so these are kind of desperate times. Now keep this in mind. Islam rejects Israel's right to own the land. Right? So that's, that's, the re that's one of the main reasons for all that's going on, all the contentions there. They do not believe that Israel has a right to be in the land or even a right to exist. Many, many terrorist organizations, more militant Muslims, believe that Israel should be decimated completely. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's get, let's get into the Christian realm now. In some Christian theological schools, they would say that since the nation failed to embrace Jesus at his first coming, 
that God has forever rejected Israel as a nation. Rejected him forever. God has repealed or terminated the Abrahamic covenant. They forfeited their ownership of the land. And they acknowledge that God will save individual Jews, perhaps, but he has no present or future program for Israel as a nation. In some schools of thought. That's not our school of thought, but in some schools of thought, that's the way it goes. They say that God's unique relationship with Israel has permanently ended. About a thousand years after the apostles were gone, track with me now, a little history before the, the message, there were some Gentile Christians that said that the true spiritual heirs of Israel, that, uh, that some Gentile Christians claim that they are now the true spiritual heirs of Israel, and they claim that for themselves, and also all the promises that God gave to the Hebrews are now given to them instead of, instead of Israel. Tertullian, an early church father, said it this way. Remember Esau and Jacob? He said, Jacob represented Christians. I don't know how he got that, but Jacob in the Old Testament represents Christians. Christians, and he, he went this far to say, Christians would overcome the Jews, and the Jews would now serve the Christians. Origen said this, and well, keep in mind that Origen, he he originated the allegorizing and spiritualizing method of biblical interpretation. That would mean, instead of taking the Bible straight for what it says, that you have this way of always seeing meanings behind the meanings, which is very dangerous. If something is written figuratively, you take it figuratively. Jesus said, I'm the door by which you must be saved. He's not a door, but he's like a door, right? But in most other cases, we kind of go by the historical grammatical method, which, which just means you take the Bible for what it says, and you don't assign uh, hidden meanings or extra meanings or meanings on top of meanings of Bible verses. So origin originated some of that. And so everywhere where you see Israel in the Bible, it means church. He, and he even went on to reject the concept of physical resurrection. We know that's wrong. And he believed in universal salvation. Everybody's going to get saved. All humans and angels are going to get saved. That's sometimes what spiritual, spiritualizing the Bible leads to. Guess who else has this view that God has done with Israel, in that sense, the Catholic Church? And no wonder why that they have priests and a multi-layered clergy, because they are so rooted sometimes in the Old Testament in a wrong kind of way that they, they transferred all the priests and all those levels of leadership. By the way, the theology that says that the Lord has no place for Israel and they have no place in the land is called replacement theology. And that also includes the rejection of the earthly political kingdom of God that the Jews so long believed God promised to them. So in other words, there'll be a day that the Jews believe that there's going to be this earthly political spiritual kingdom. And Believers in Christ as well, many Christians believe that there's going to be this thousand-year millennial reign of Christ by which Jesus will rule from Jerusalem. The Jews will have, believing Jews will have a prominent place. Gentiles will, will go to Jerusalem for a type of pilgrimage and all of that kind of a thing. But in replacement theology, there's a rejection of all of that, saying a lot of times we're in some kind of millennial kingdom right now. Right now we're in it. Some would even go so far as to say that the devil is bound now and that the church is going to, I guess, get so strong and usher in the kingdom themselves. Um, uh, someone else who, who, who popularized that in, um, in church history is, uh, is Augustine. And um, he even wrote a tract against the Jews. It, it, was a tract, it was called Tract Against the Jews. And he was very derogatory toward the Jews. And it, early, early on in his thought, he believed in the thousand-year reign of Christ. But then he... You know, he was influenced by philosophy quite a bit, and so he kind of slid from that position. And the Roman Catholic Church adopted his view of things. And no wonder why that the Roman Catholic Church believed they could enforce uh, their policies on all people, and especially Jews. In other words, politically, they could make, uh, make an enforcements. Martin Luther, who did a great job, I think I mentioned him last week, he did a great job in confronting the Catholic Church. Hands down, salvation by faith, and he was right in confronting the uh, unscriptural practices of the Catholic Church. 
And early on in his life, he had a compassion for Jews and even an enthusiasm for their conversion. But toward the end of his life, he got funny. Toward the end of his life, he said, it is useless to convert any Jew, and he accused them of a relentless hatred of Christianity, and he accused them of all the crimes that their enemies charged them with, like poisoning people, ritual murders, and assassinations. Luther said that princes should persecute them mercilessly, and um, preachers should set mobs against them. So wouldn't you agree with me, went off the deep end? Even if he thought that Israel didn't have a right to the land anymore, and that the church replaced Israel theologically, you definitely shouldn't do that kind of stuff, right? Because there are believers that you know, believe in this replacement theology, but they don't do that. But he went on to, he even said more. He urged that synagogues be burned, their houses be burned down, and books be taken from them, rabbis being prohibited from teaching, and Jews should be set to hard labor and unmerciful treatment. Our man Luther went off the deep end at that point. Quote from Luther, What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people to Jews? Since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct. Now we are aware of their lying and reviling and blaspheming. Wow. Wow. He viewed the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD as evidence of God's permanent rejection of the Jews. The Jews are no longer the people of God. Thus, all the Gentiles who are Christians are the true Israelites and the new Jews born of Christ and noblest Jew. Now you see where that can sometimes lead? We, we are the new Jews. God has no program for the Jews anymore. By the way, we don't believe that because God made so many promises that are, that I'll, and I'll read some of them, to the Jewish nation. Amazing promises that he's going to fulfill because he's faithful. Because he's faithful. And thankfully, not all Christians who believe the church replaced Israel are anti-Semitic. And we're thankful for that. But guess who? Guess who read Luther and got some bad ideas? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. He embraced some of what Luther wrote, and that led him to take it even further. As you know, the systematic elimination of millions of Jews and the Holocaust. Now, when Jews began to pour back into the land and Israel became a state officially in 1948, as per the United Nations... Then there was kind of another swing in theology. And there's always been believers, you know, people that believe that God had a program for Israel. But now there was a, you know, it was hard for people to say that the Lord, that the Lord is done with Israel because they were pouring back into the land. It became a state. And it began to make people go back to the Bible and think, well, wait a second. God promised them the land. And he really talks about their restoration as a nation spiritually as well. Wow, maybe, maybe, just maybe, all those promises are not spiritualized to the church, but maybe they're real for Israel. And so there was, there was a great movement. Um, seminaries like Dallas Theological Seminary, Grace Theological Seminary, Grand Rapids Baptist, Western Seminaries, Talbot, Philadelphia College of the Bible, Denver, the Master Seminary that I went to, Moody Bible Institute, really began to look at things in a different way and you know, that God had a, pro, a future program for Israel. There was a certain, you know, dispensation in the Old Testament, and now God has a program for the church, and then he's going to go back and do something special for Israel. There's been a partial hardening of Israel. Israel has disobeyed, and I'll get into that, and they went through many hard times, but God has promised to them a special future. There's been a partial hardening of Israel, Romans 11, until the fullness of Gentiles come in. Many popular radio Teachers in the past century have promoted these kind of views. Some of these include uh, M.R. Dehan, Richard Dehan, Epp, Wearsby, Kroll, McGee, Swindoll, Rogers, Stanley, Falwell, MacArthur. And parachurch organizations like Navigators, Campus Crusade for Christ, and Youth for Christ believe that God has a program, future program for Israel. Now, you have different views on it. What really counts? What really, really counts is what the Bible says. But I want to say one more thing before I get into a lot of scriptures. If God promised Israel the land, let's say, and promised to spiritually restore them, and then 
we say, well, those are all for the church. Does that mean the original promises, meaning to them, didn't really, in a straightforward manner, mean that when Israel read it? When, they, when the Jews were reading it, what were they supposed to read? That it was going to be the church that would embrace all, all the fulfillment and they would be pushed to the side? I don't know that the original reading, reading would be that. Listen to this. What a great statement. Uh, Michael Vlack made this statement. Listen to this. In addition, we must not lose sight of the fact that the Old Testament prophecies and covenants were given to specific audiences at times in history. Thus, these revelations had relevance for the original times in history. Thus, these revelations, I'm sorry, had revelations, Original, these revelations had re, re, relevance for the original audiences. This is, easy, this is easy to forget for those of us living thousands of years after the Old Testament was completed. But we have to remember that the content of these revelations mattered to the original audience. The Jews believed they were going to be in their land. The Jews believed Messiah would reign in their land because of what the Bible said. When God revealed himself to the authors and audiences of of the Old Testament revelations, he revealed truths to them as well. The original writers and audiences of the Old Testament revelation understood God to be promising literal spiritual and physical blessings to a future generation of ethnic Israel. Real promises were made to real Jews for the future. Do we have a right to say, we know that you were led to believe that God would do these things for the nation Israel, but now with the coming of the New Testament revelation, we know better. They're just pictures of the greater spiritual realities for the church. Did you track with me on that? So it's almost like making a switch. I'm promising you kids a lot of, I'm promising you a lot of presents for Christmas. Ah, I really meant it was for the kids in Timbuktu. Now, More important than anything, let's get into the scriptures, right? Jewish people, the original chosen. You know what God said to Abraham, right? He was going to make him a great nation. He was going to bless him. He was going to make his name great, and all those things took place. He was going to bless everybody that blessed Israel and curse everybody that cursed Israel, right? And in through Israel and Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. On that note alone, we shouldn't be anti-Semitic. On that note alone, we're indebted to the Jewish people and how God worked through them. Because the Messiah came through them. The Bible came through them. The prophets came through them. As I said before, the apostles came through them. And it even says, if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse them, you're going to be cursed. Right? Deuteronomy 7. Now get your Bibles out. You're going to need your Bibles today. Different kind of message. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For you're a holy people to Yahweh your God... Yahweh, your God, has chosen you to be a people for his own treasured possessions out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Hey, like it or not, God, he chose to choose them. And he's going to go on to say, not because they were anything special. He just chose to do it. And it's okay. The original chosen. It wasn't the Italians. I'm Italian. It wasn't Italians. Who cares? Don't be mad at them. The original chosen. Yahweh did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath he swore to your fathers, Yahweh brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the Pharaoh king of Egypt. Listen to this. The choosing of Israel was grounded in God's love and his faithfulness to the promises he made to the patriarchs, not in any merit or intrinsic goodness in Israel. It wasn't because they were great. He just chose to do it. But recognize he did it. And they are the original chosen nation. Verse 9. You shall know that Yahweh, your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations who love him. Now go to Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 28. God made this nation prominent. And by the way, They're going to have a special prominence in the millennial kingdom. And if we're in the millennial kingdom, they're not prominent yet if we're in it already, which I don't believe we are. Deuteronomy 28. Now, if it will be if you diligently listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, Yahweh God will set you high above the nations of the earth. 
He chose a nation. Can you name any other nation he chose special like this? It's interesting, isn't it? America is not a chosen nation in this sense. Nope. Blessed nation in many ways. You drop down to verse 13. And, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you'll be above and you'll not be beneath if you listen to the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I'm commanding you today to keep and to do it. Do you realize that Jews have made many contributions to society, to the world? Cures for diseases, new technologies, musical masterpieces. They were trailblazers in many areas. You know that. In fact, probably so much so that people began to be jealous of them. And Israel today is strong. I mean, they've been built up in all kinds of ways, right? Agriculturally, if you study that, maybe I'll bring that to you another week. It's amazing how the land is blossoming. It's amazing how economically they've gotten strong militarily. It's amazing. The rebirth of the nation. Now, if we believe God has no plan for Israel, it kind of just happened. Not for much reason. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I can't believe that for a minute. Now, did they, do, do, did they disobey Lord, the Lord to their, to their dismay? Yes. Were there consequences? Were there punishments? Yes. But as I told you last time, for the nation of Israel, there's both punishment and restoration. If you drop down, same, same chapter, Deuteronomy 28, verse 63. Watch this. And it'll be as Yahweh delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you. So Yahweh will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you. And you'll be torn from the land which you're entering to possess it. Moreover, Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And you shall serve other gods wood and stone which you and your fathers have not known. Now in verse 65, it's going to talk about, it's predicting the hard time the Jews will have in other people's lands. And you know this happened. Right? I mean, I'm reading some book on it. It happens so often in so many places throughout history. Moreover, among the nations you shall find no relief. There'll be no resting place for the sole of your foot. There, there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. And your life shall hang in doubt before you. And you'll be in dread day and night, and shall not have any faith in your life. In the morning you'll say, what, what were evening? In the evening you'll say, what were morning? Because of the dread of your heart which you dread, and because of the sight of your eyes, which you shall see. Jewish experience in many nations has been unbearable. And even today to some extent, right? As anti-Semitism is increasing. The unbearable nature of the present condition of Israel even. Many Jews today are not even feeling safe. Now, as much as the Lord scattered Jewish people all through the earth, I mentioned before, there's been this amazing coming back to the land. Go to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. God promised not only to bring them back to the land, but to spiritually regenerate them. Ezekiel 36, 24. And the reason I give a lot of verses instead of just kind of like just preaching it only kind of thing is that I really want you to see it because I want you to see it for yourself. I know in, you know, in the evangelical world there is a, is a smattering of views on these topics. But I urge you to study it for yourself. And I'm, I'm showing you some places to go to. Ezekiel 36, 24. Watch this. The Lord says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands... And bring you where? Into your own land. I'll sprinkle you clean water on you, and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your uncleanness from your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. Is this the church or Israel a promise? I mean, you've got to make a choice, right? Church or Israel? I pick church. I mean, I pick Israel, sorry. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to do my judgments and you will inhabit the land that I gave to your father. You'll inhabit the land that I gave to your father. 
Hmm. We're not the Jews told about a Messiah. Right? Think of the famous Christmas verse. Think about the fact that the Jews were promised a Messiah. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given. The government will rest on his shoulders. The name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So they, they were promised a Messiah. But I love what it says in Ezekiel 37. The same Messiah is spoken about this way in verse 24. My servant David will be king over them, and they'll have one shepherd. They'll walk in my judgments and keep my statutes. Verse 25, they will inhabit the land, the land I gave to Jacob, my servant. Now, wait a second. Messiah is going to rule and reign in the land? Has that happened yet? Put your thinking caps on now. Has that happened yet? Has, has Jesus ruled over the nation of Israel in the land that God gave to their father Jacob? No, not yet. So that has to be future. But it's going to happen. That's the encouragement. It's all going toward that. In fact, when I was at the Jewish Senate the other day, there was a short man with a yarmulke, and I, I guess he knew he's Jewish because of the yarmulke, and I wanted to talk to him. I showed him Jeremiah 31, where basically it says that the, the stars and uh, the sun and the moon are going to you know, keep their orbits and their rotations, and as long as they do, Israel will not cease to be a nation. He wasn't too impressed by it. He was, he was impressed by my first statement. I said, I believe Israel has a right to the land and God's going to protect them. And was, as I showed him the Bible, he just kind of looked at me and he walked away. I thought that was going to open up a whole conversation. That doesn't mean you don't try. We need to witness the Jewish people. They need to know that there are believers that really love them, that there are Christians that really love them, believe they have a right to the land, and believe the promises that God made to their people. So I urge you, I urge you to do that. A friend, um, as you know, as you know, even though Israel was promised the Messiah when Jesus came, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Uh, you know that. Um, in fact, it was predicted. Go to Isaiah 53. It was predicted. The rejection of the Messiah by the world, really, right? I mean, the whole world didn't know him. Gentiles didn't know him as well until God's grace came. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, a root out of parched ground. He had, he had no stately form or majesty so that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. And then later it says, yet we, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Why was he a man of sorrows? He was rejected by his own people. And by the Gentiles. Many Jews believed that he was being punished by God. And yet, he was promised to that nation. Uh, when Jesus chose 12 men, what kind of men did he choose? Jew or Gentile? Jews. Everything's Jewish about our faith. That's why Romans 11 says that we were grafted in. It's kind of like, he's almost saying, you know, not, not, I don't like the word lucky, but you Gentiles were kind of lucky that, you know, the original branches were taken out and you, the wild olive tree, were grafted in to the original Jewish root. We're indebted to them. We should love them. We should witness to them. At the same time that Jesus was grooming 12 men to be his disciples, at the same time, the Jewish religious leaders were doing what? Plotting to kill Jesus. Some Jews believed, some Jews didn't. Some wanted to throw him off a cliff. Others were bringing questions to try to stump him. How can you stump Messiah? Twelve men being groomed to spread the gospel. 
Jewish leaders plotting to destroy him. Once they apprehended Jesus, they sentenced him to crucifixion. As you know, Jesus died and rose from the dead. And remember when he told his men to stay in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit? Go to Acts 1 now. Go to Acts 1, verse 6. They're waiting for the promise of the Spirit. Jesus appeared to people, and basically his disciples, over a period of 40 days to etch in their minds the fact that he rose from the dead. But it's very interesting what's said in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they came together, as they were waiting for the Holy Spirit, they were asking him, saying, Lord, what's the question? Lord, is it at this time you are, what? Restoring the kingdom to Israel. What's that all about? They knew. They knew there was going to be a literal physical kingdom. They knew it. What did Jesus say to them? It's not for you to know the times or seasons by which the Father is set by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. By the way, no matter what your view ends up being, witness to everybody you can. Great commission. But I would say this. God made promises to Israel that he will keep. If he doesn't, what would that make the Lord? A liar. Do we spiritualize all the promises and say they all came to the church? And so he didn't have any of those. The meaning of those in the Old Testament really had no meaning for Israel, really. But it really had an intent for the church and not for Israel. Think about it this way, too. And I'm going to say this in a second. There's always going to be a remnant of Jews that are saved. Always. Okay? And every, everybody that really believes the Bible should believe that. And every time period, God is going to save Jewish people. But what about that future time? Track with me that, you know, there's so many places. We could do this all day. We could. I want to do this all day. Zechariah 14. Just listen. You'll go there later. Then Yahweh will go forth. Now, this is when all the nations are going to come against Israel, right? In the, in the last of the end times, the nations come against Israel, and Jesus returns. But watch this. And Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations. Verse 3. As the day when he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet. It's talking about the Lord's feet. It's got to be Jesus, right? In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, the real Mount of Olives, right? Which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Verse 9, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth. Verse 16, whatever nations are left will go up year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Has that happened yet? Did Jesus drop down on the Mount of Olives? Did it split? Did all the nations come against Israel? Well, they're starting to, but did they all come against, did they come against Israel and Jesus came back to save the day, the time of Jacob's trouble? Some of Israel will be punished, others will be saved. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And there'll be a time when the nations in the millennial kingdom go up and worship the king. Has that happened yet? Uh-uh. Is it going to happen? Well, the Bible predicted it. I mean, what choice do we have with that verse? <laughs> Zechariah 14, what do you do with it? If you, think, if you think that the church is now completely the new Israel, in some sense we are because Jew and Gentile are together in Christ, but not in a sense that all these promises given to Israel are taken away. There's, not, there's only a couple choices. Let's go further. Let's go further. Let's go to the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. Oh, before I say that, Zechariah 12. Go to Zechariah for this 12 through 14. I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, so they'll look on me whom they've pierced. When are they going to do that? The whole, a good bulk of the nation is going to look upon Jesus and say, oh man, we missed it. They're going to look on me whom they've pierced and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they'll weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping for the firstborn. 
beginning of chapter 13, and that day a fountain will be opened up for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. It sounds like God's going to do some special regeneration of the nation of Israel, doesn't it? That don't sound like church verses to me. There's a Jews mourning over the one they pierced, it says. They pierced them. They're credited with piercing them. We know the Romans had a lot to do with it as well. Anyway, are you tracking with me? Now go to Acts chapter 2. Verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now why did I say that? The first, on a day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jews are going to get saved. God is not done with Israel, is he? 3,000 get saved. Presumably they're all Jews. That's what it said. Drop down to verse 14. And Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice. Because, right, remember that people, that's when, that was the real gift of speaking in tongues, a real language. So the people in the upper room there are given this ability to speak in the languages of Jews that came, went to other nations and learned other languages. It's an amazing thing. They spoke in their languages, the wonderful works of God. After that, Peter's going to explain what's going on in the midst of his sermon. He says, Peter, but Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to get that men of Judea, Jews, right? Jews, Jews, Jews. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. This is what is spoken through the prophet Joel. Now, before I read it, here's our choices for this. It's either, it's either this is a partial pre-fulfillment of what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. In other words, what's operating here, the Spirit of God is being poured out on people like he's going to be poured out in the millennial kingdom, or all this already happened. You have to make a choice, really. You have to say that everything that it says there happened completely at that time, including the sun becoming dark and all of that. Could it be there's an application to the church at the time, the church being born, and a future fulfillment of those verses from the book of Joel? He's quoting Joel chapter 2, verses 20, 28 to 32. Look at it. Acts 2, 17. It shall be in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Some have wrongly used this to say there should be female preachers these days. That's a wrong application of that verse, trust me. It, your, uh, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves and both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. They shall prophesy. I'll grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below, Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. It shall be that everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, was it a partial fulfillment on a day of Pentecost or, or, or full fulfillment? Well, think of it this way. Where else have you heard that phrase, the sun will be turned into darkness and to moon into blood? Haven't you heard that in Matthew 24? Right after the tribulation, and the great tribulation, it says the sun will be darkened. Go to Matthew 24. This is Bible study today, people. Matthew 24, 29. I suppose you've got to link up these verses, right? By the way, whatever view you come out with has to make sense with the most verses. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, and by the way, it said before, it's a tribulation that has never been since the beginning of the world, so I guess it didn't happen. There are some people that believe all these things have happened already. They have to do stuff like that to try to get it out of the way. But anyway, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. You know, I really think the sun's going to be darkened, don't you? I mean, really think it's going to happen, like, literally? I don't want to... How do you spiritual... If you, if you start playing the allegorical spiritualizing game, man, if you can do that with a lot of verses and then nothing means nothing, Harold Camping did that, and that's how he got himself in such trouble predicting the end of the world and, and the return of Christ, and he was wrong. And remember when he was saying, you know, nobody should go to no churches because the church age is over. And it's only him. It's only him who's left who's preaching the truth, pretty much. He went, really went off the deep end. That man went, woo! 
We don't want to do that. I, I kind of like to take the Bible like for what it says. I mean, I'm sorry, but the sign of the Son of Man, I'm sorry, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky. Oh, how can stars fall? It just says the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then what? The sign of the Son of Man will appear, and all the tribes of the earth will what? They're going to mourn at the second coming. And the Jews will too. And they'll see the sign of the, the Son of Man coming on the clouds. That, that's literal, right? Is he coming on the clouds? It better be literal. There's even some dudes that try to spiritualize that one. Say it happened already. It's like, oh my word, no. And even, even some of the other guys say they're, they're too far gone. Um, He'll coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Praise God, he's coming back this way. He'll send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Back to Acts 2. Peter's preaching. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed um, through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And I won't read it, but you go down to Acts 2.42, 3,000 are saved. It goes on to say they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And those are 3,000, what kind of people? Jews. Jerusalem church, mostly Jewish at, at the beginning. And it ends up being 5,000 later. God is not done. You go to Acts chapter 4, and you know the priests and the temple guard and Sadducees are now coming against those who are preaching. So yeah, some Jews are believing, and some Jews are not believing. Go to Acts 13 for a second. Acts 13, 44. When the Apostle Paul and the other apostles went to a city, where would they first go to preach? Synagogue. Temple. It's the power of, you know, the gospel is the power of God to the Jew first and also to the Greek, right? Acts 13, 44. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the crowds, were filled with they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting things spoken and by Paul and blaspheming. Yes, there were Jews that really came against the preaching. Verse 46, though. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you rejected and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. At that time, at that time, since those Jews in that town were, you know, rejecting it, they went to the Gentiles. But that verse doesn't mean that, you know, you don't preach to Jews anymore. Can't mean that. We, we read enough verses to say that. And then right away in the next chapter 14, it says, Now it happened at Iconium that they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and Greeks. Right in the next chapter, Jews are starting to believe. More, Jew, or more Jews are believing. But then the next verse says, But the unbelieving Jews instigated and embittered the minds against the Gentiles. Jews who believe, Jews who don't believe. All through Christian history. All through church history. Now, having said all of that, how should we view the Jews? How should we view the Jewish people? How should we view the promises that were made to them? Well, listen. The Apostle Paul knew all these things, right? Remember, we said last time in Romans nine that he was so broken up that he could wish himself a curse for the sake of his brethren. He could just about wish that he was separated from Christ. He said it literally like we read last week, Romans 9, I'm telling the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience testifies me with the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow, unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the Lord, the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who's God over all. What's he saying? He can almost wish he was going to hell himself for the sake of his brethren. He loved them so much. He didn't say that God's done with them, did he? 
And he even says they, you know, they had all these blessings and privileges that were given to them that by extension we benefit from. The giving of the law, the temple, the promises, the Christ himself. And then in Romans 10 he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is there for, for their salvation. Brothers and sisters, love the Jews and pray for them. Now go to Romans 11. I was supposed to preach on Romans 11. I couldn't get to it. Romans 11. Just the first verse. Give me a chance for the first verse. I say then, has God rejected his people? May it never be. And Paul says, look, I too am an Israelite. He says, what about me, right? I too am an Israelite, a seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Isn't that powerful? Hey, even when the Jews rejected Jesus, how did he feel about it? Matthew 23, 37, broken up. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. They did, right? How often I want to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you did not want it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Oh, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. When are they going to say that? I'll give you a little food for thought there, right? Yeah, they rejected Jesus as a nation. But even though they rejected Jesus, has God rejected them? The answer there is as strong as it can be in the Greek, may it never be. The answer is no, people. Oh, he stretched out his hands. Verse 21 of that, of, the, of, uh, of chapter 10, the chapter before, but as for Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient, obstinate people. The love of the Lord for Israel. Has God rejected his people? May it never be. It's a strong no, definitely not. King James says, God forbid. It's totally inconceivable that God would go back on his promises to them. Do you realize he used, that, he used that may it never be statement 14 times, 10 in the book of Romans, and it's always used to counteract a misunderstanding. He did it in Romans 3. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, does their unbelief abolish the faithfulness of God? May it never be. Let God be true, every man a liar. Why is God going to save a good portion of Israel and, and get them back to the land and all of that for that reason? Because he's a faithful God to his promises. You get it? Paul even says here, may it never be, I'm really Jewish and he saved me. He's as Jewish as they come. He's the most kosher guy there was. He's an Israelite, seed of Abraham, tribe, most important tribe. I'm really Jewish and I got saved. And think about it, people. The Lord chose to save a fanatical Christ-hating Jew. That means he can save any Jewish person. The very Jews you interact, or Jewish people you interact with could be saved. Verse 5, Romans 11. In this way then, at the present time, a remnant, according to God's gracious choice, has come to be. God's going to make sure of it because he's a sovereign God. At the end of the day, it goes back to sovereignty. I don't have time. I won't do it now. But you look up on your own. You say, well, where else are Jews getting saved? Well, then you go to Revelation 7. Remember the, 12, the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel that are going to be saved? Jehovah Witnesses say it's Jehovah Witnesses. I don't even know what other guys say. I think it's Jews because it's saying they're, they're Jews. I mean, this makes me crazy, this topic. But anyway, I'll end on this note. I got to end. I got to end. I don't want to end. I want to keep going. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Just look at that for a second. Obviously, we'll continue this topic. Just look at it. In light of all we said, Paul says, who's Jewish? Who's inspired? Who knows all the theology? I do not want you brothers to be uninformed of this mystery. You know, it's very important we're not ignorant on this topic, is it? He says it. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation that what? What type of hardening? Partial. There's a remnant of Jews always being saved, right? Partial hardening has happened to Israel as a nation until what? The fullness of Gentiles has come in. 
And so, all Israel would be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he'll remove ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them. You say, wait a second, did he make a new covenant with us? Well, sure. But he promises in Jeremiah 31 a new covenant with the nation as well, right? So Jews are getting saved, individual Jews are getting the benefit of the new covenant now. But I believe there'll be a future time when the nation itself gets the benefit of a new covenant, of the new covenant as well. And what does that say for us? You heard the man today. You heard, you heard Joe today. Gideon's spreads the word of God and Bible's all over the place. I urge you to do the same and keep a lookout for Jewish people and in light of what's happening too, keep a lookout for Muslims and tell them all about Jesus because that's the bottom line of what they need to know. Don't debate the topics. Because look, there's a veil over Jewish hearts, but that veil is removed in Christ, right? And for, with the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you see a Jewish person, you don't think of them, don't think of them in, in, a, in a wrong kind of way. Quite the opposite. Think of the history and think of God's promises. Let's pray. Let's take a moment and listen. Whatever you think about these topics, go home and study for yourself. We encourage all good Bible churches, encourage independent study. Meditate on these things. But no matter what, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, right? The gospel continues to spread. Lord, I thank you so much for this, uh, for this day. I thank you for what you did in my heart this week as I studied your word, Lord. You're a faithful God to all generations. It's an amazing thing as we see it with our own eyes, Lord. What's happening in the world now is matching what your word says about what would happen. We see nations coming against Israel. We, can, we see even the prospect and the, and the, and the great, uh, the great uh, um, possibility that a, that a world leader is going to arise soon to try to bring peace, Lord. We see, um, Lord, we see the, everything being positioned. Uh, for the kind of things that you say are going to happen in the end of the end times. But nevertheless, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be particularly close to you, Lord, and spreading your word. Give us, give us a love for the Jewish people in the midst of it all. Um, and we pray, Lord, that we might even speak to Jewish people about these things as others are attacking them. And, and Lord, I, I pray that you'd, you'd raise us up as... Uh, strong evangelists to people at this time. And as all people are thinking about these issues, Lord, help us to get into the mix and to tell them about Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.